Let's turn for our scripture reading uh, this morning to 1 Samuel and chapter 17. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 uh, is the chapter that describes for us the battle between David and Goliath. Uh, And uh, consequently is one of the best known passages, I'm sure, uh, in the whole of the Old Testament. Uh, God willing, I'd like us to focus on this chapter today, both this morning and this evening. Um, It's a very long chapter, and this morning we'll only get perhaps as far as verse 30. Uh, So if you don't want to know what happens at the end, don't look at verses 49 and 50, because you'll work out who wins. Uh, So there's a spoiler alert there. Uh, But uh, we'll look perhaps at the first half of the chapter this morning, and then God will in the second half of the chapter this evening. So we'll read from 1 Samuel, chapter 17, beginning at the first verse. Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Azekah in Aphes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And a champion went from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armour on his legs, and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, And his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants." But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone down to follow Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest, and the three oldest followed Saul. But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself forty days, morning and evening. Then Jesse said to his son David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper, and took the things and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight, and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath. Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. We'll give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, 
What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Amen. Well, let's turn uh, for a little while this morning back to 1 Samuel and chapter 17 and that great story of uh, David and Goliath. Uh, I'm sure it's a story that you know well. Uh, my little joke about issuing a spoiler alert at the start really was a joke, wasn't it? If there's one story that we know uh, from the Old Testament, one story perhaps that uh, we've been taught uh, ever since we were in Sunday school, if we had the blessing of that, it's the story of David and Goliath. And uh, in some senses, that makes the task of the preacher, as we come to a passage like this, uh, a little bit more difficult. Uh, I feel almost as if I'm telling you a joke that you already know the punchline of. Or I'm reading you an article from the newspaper, and you've already read it. Uh, and uh, we can come to this story already knowing it uh, so well, can't we, that we might miss what God would have us learn from it. It's a story that's uh, uh, even still known in the world today, isn't it? Uh, if you're a football fan like me, every round of the FA Cup, uh, when you watch it uh, discussed on the television, you can almost guarantee that David and Goliath will get a mention. Uh, because uh, uh, any, any match between a, a side, perhaps in one of the lower divisions, and a side in the premiership is, is categorised as a David and Goliath moment, isn't it? And uh, I think I'm right in saying that there's even an advert on the television at the moment uh, that uh, draws from the story of David uh, and Goliath. Uh, even out in the world, the story of David and Goliath is known. The danger, of course, is that we just see it as a story about being a plucky underdog, because that's uh, how it's applied, isn't it? Uh, if there's a plucky underdog, and British people always like the underdog, don't they? Uh, the David and Goliath story is wheeled out, and it becomes uh, the story of the plucky underdog. But that's not why we have the story here in the scriptures, is it? Uh, this story is obviously meant to teach us far more than to give us hope when the odds are stacked against us. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the actual story of the battle really doesn't begin uh, until verse 40 at the earliest. Uh, and uh, the action doesn't really start until verse 49. And so we might ask the question, well, why does it take the writer of 1 Samuel so long to get to the point? Why is it that we have to go through all of these verses? Why is it that the writer seems to spend more time on the preparations for the battle uh, and setting the scene for the battle than he actually does in telling us what happens at the end of the story? Well, there must be a reason for that, mustn't there? All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is profitable to us as we live our lives from day to day. And if the writer of 1 Samuel, whoever he was, uh, decided to write in such great detail about these things, there must be a reason for it. We're meant to learn from it. It's always a good thing to do when you're reading the history books of the Old Testament to focus your attention on what the writer focuses. Don't rush straight to the part that you think might be the most important, but allow the writer to tell you the story. There are no wasted words in Scripture. Uh, the writer isn't just setting the scene to build up the story to the great climax. He's not writing a soap opera. He's writing the word of God. He's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so uh, if uh, these first 30 verses don't actually get us to the crunch, that might not be the most important thing this morning. The most important thing is that we see perhaps what the writer wants us to see. I want to suggest to you that there are three timeless truths that this passage illustrates for us. 
that we can take out tomorrow uh, into the situations where we live, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces, in our social circles, as we seek to live the Christian life 3,000 years uh, after this event first took place. Now, the first of those truths, I think, is very clear, and that is that though the enemy seems so powerful, he didn't win. Though the enemy seemed so powerful, he didn't win. Now, the writer here seems deliberately to want to show us just what a predicament the Israelites faced, just what a champion Goliath of Gath was. You see how so much of the first section of the chapter is there to describe him to us. Uh, and to show us the effect he had on the children of Israel. Now, as we look at him, we have to say, uh, this is an extraordinary man, uh, isn't he? Uh, He is the champion of the Philistines. Now, of course, if you know 1 Samuel, and if you know the book of Joshua and Judges that go before it, you know that the Philistines really shouldn't have still been there to challenge God's people. The fact that they're there is because of the failure of former generations, It's because when the children of Israel took possession of the land that God had promised them, promised them way back, and they went in, you remember in the book of Joshua, they didn't take the whole land. They didn't give all, uh, didn't take all that God had given them. And uh, that uh, heaped up all sorts of problems for them in the years to come. And so there were still Philistines there. There was still enemy territory that shouldn't have been there. And of course, uh, if you know the end of 1 Samuel chapter 14, And the end of Saul's reign, you know that Saul didn't deal with the Philistines as he should. You see, when we are not obedient to God's commands, it often costs us, and sometimes it costs us future generations as well. There's a lesson there for us, isn't there, about being faithful in our day and our generation for the sake of those who will follow us. But even leaving that aside, the Philistines are represented by this giant of a man. And uh, he's described for us, isn't he? He's described as being six cubits in a span. Now, we're not absolutely sure uh, what that measurement means. But, uh, and if you look at the commentaries, there's a wide range. Most people think that's about nine and a half foot. So this is a big guy. He's a really big guy. Uh, Some people even say it could be as much as 11 foot. Uh, At the bottom end of the scale, he might have only been seven and a half foot. But seven and a half foot is still seven and a half foot, isn't it? You know, this is a big, impressive man. Uh, And uh, he comes out tooled up as well, doesn't he? You see how he's described for us here in these verses. Uh, His height is six cubits in a span, verse 4 says. He has a bronze helmet on his head. He's armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels uh, of bronze. Uh, We're told that's about 251 pounds in weight. So he's uh, well equipped, isn't he? And then you notice how it goes on. Uh, He had bronze armor on his legs, a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear, just the staff of his spear, was like a weaver's beam. His spearhead weighed 600 shekels. That's that's quite a spear, isn't it? You see how tooled up he is. Uh, You see the shield bearer goes before him and he stands and he bellows before the children of Israel. Uh, He seems to have this idea that uh, we'll have a a representative fight. You send your best man out to fight me and uh, if he wins, uh, there's no need for all this bloodshed, no need for us to... Uh, combat as armies. If uh, your man defeats me, well, uh, that's uh, the end of the contest and we'll serve you. But if, uh, if I beat your best man, then that means you've got to follow us and you've got to serve us. So that's the idea. And he comes in all his pomp and all his glory, all his magnificence. And with this big beaming voice, he shouts to the children of Israel. And a little later in the chapter, we read that he does this for 40 days, morning and evening. And it has the desired effect, doesn't it? Because you notice again and again, we're told how the children of Israel respond. We notice again and again how fearful they are. You see it there in verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You see it in verse 24. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. You see, if his intention is to scare the living daylights out of the people of Israel, he's achieved it. 
because he's so big and he's so strong. And there's no hope, surely, for the children of Israel that they're going to defeat this man. Uh, There is no chance for him, is there? Everything is in his favor. Uh, It seems as if there is no hope for God's chosen people. and, And that's the way they respond. That's why they run away. That's why they cower before the enemy. And, uh, well, let's not throw stones. If we'd been there, we'd have probably done the same thing, wouldn't we? Nine foot six, tooled up uh, as he was. What chance is there? And you see, that's repeated for us again and again. Uh, And the writer uh, of 1 Samuel wants us to see that, wants us, in a sense, to be impressed by it. But then, of course, he also wants us to realise That just because he's big and he's strong and he seems to be calling all the shots, it doesn't mean he's going to win. You see, if you just turn back to the chapter before, uh, we've got that warning, haven't we, not to look at outward appearances. In chapter 16, that chapter where God's favour leaves Saul and goes to David when David is anointed. Do you remember what God says there in verse 7? Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature. Because I have refused him. The Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. You see, you and I can be like these children of Israel. We see the enemy. and We see how strong and how mighty the enemy is. and We see uh, how difficult our circumstances might be in our world. And we might think the game is up. That can be true of us as Christians. That can be true of us as the Christian church in our own land. In some senses, the situation that Israel faced is just the same as the situation we face. We see our enemy, don't we? And it seems as if he's calling all the shots. It seems as if uh, he is big and strong and mighty and tooled up against God's New Testament people. And we might ask the question, what hope do we have? Of course, the children of Israel should have known their history, shouldn't they? They should have known that God had delivered them in situations like this before. These people had been delivered from Egypt, from Pharaoh, from Pharaoh's army. They knew, or they should have known, the story of Exodus, when against all the odds, God delivered them. They should have known the story of Passover. They should have known the story of the Red Sea, uh, when that great army was coming behind them, and there were mountains either side of them, and there was water in front of them, and the situation seemed hopeless. And the sound of Pharaoh's chariots and the hooves of his horses were just as loud as the claims of Goliath as he shouted across the valley of Elah that day. And they should have said, God delivered us in the past. And God can deliver us again. Or what about that day they faced Jericho, that huge walled city. And if they were going to take Canaan, they had to take Jericho. How were they going to take Jericho, this great city? And there they are marching around with their trumpets. What hope is there in that? Jericho is too strong. And of course, God had the victory, didn't he? And of course, as we look at the rest of the scripture, we see it again and again, don't we? We see Daniel in the lion's den. We see Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego are there in the fiery furnace. And the enemy seems so powerful. And then, of course, we see the cross, don't we? And there the enemy seems really to have got the upper hand. Jesus is being nailed to a cross. Jesus is dying. God's great plan of salvation, where does it stand as Jesus dies upon the cross? Surely the game is up for God and his cause. But it isn't, my friends, is it? Because although the enemy was mighty, the enemy is defeated. The enemy loses. And that's one of the great principles that the scripture teaches again and again to God's people. Just because the enemy is almighty, just because he seems almighty, he isn't. And as we live in 2018 here in Britain, the enemy seems strong, doesn't he? He seems to have captured every part of public life. So the media is controlled, isn't it, by the evolutionist and by the materialist and by the atheist and by the pagan. Uh, the universities of our land, uh, the television, uh, the, the celebrity generation in which we live. The Christian voice is lost, isn't it? The church seems so poor and so weak and the enemy seems so strong. But you see, the story of David and Goliath reminds us, doesn't it, that it's not about that. 
to jest because the enemy is strong. Even in the moment where there seems to be no hope, God's people shouldn't give up. God's people shouldn't run away. God's people should be strong and God's people should be fearless. You see, even though the enemy seems so powerful, he lost. And you know, God's words, and when we turn to the book of Revelation especially, we're reminded again and again, aren't we, that the enemy will lose, that the Lamb wins, that Christ and his church are triumphant. And so that we might be faced with all sorts of Goliaths as individuals, as families, as churches, as the church of Jesus Christ in our world. Remember from this story that though the enemy seems almighty, there's only one who is almighty, that's God himself. That takes us to a second point, doesn't it? And in some senses, the second point is the flip side of the first point. It's the other side of the coin. And that is that though God's deliverer seems so weak, yet we know he won. You see, what's going on here in 1 Samuel 17, and the way in which the story is told is very skillful and very beautiful. I hope you notice that. Just on a human level, the way that the story is told is amazing. Uh, Because the writer goes back and forth between one scene and another. He goes back and forth between uh, the scene uh, uh, in in the, the, the Valley of Elah there and this little pastoral scene in Bethlehem. Now, of course, David's been introduced to us in the chapter before. Samuel has been sent, hasn't he, to anoint David because Saul again and again has disobeyed God's commandments and God has taken his spirit from him and God has taken the kingdom from him and God's spirit comes upon David. You have uh, verses 14 and 15 in chapter 16, which is right in the central uh, section of the book, uh, the central verses of the central chapter of the book, the spirit of the Lord departs from Saul. Uh, and uh, in verse 13, the spirit of the Lord comes upon David. There's a, a great change going on here. And so David has been introduced to us. And in chapter 16, we've seen how humanly David is nothing, is he? It's almost as if his father's forgotten he exists. It's almost a funny story, isn't it? Samuel goes and says, God's provided a king from amongst your sons. And uh, Jesse brings them in one by one, doesn't he? And he starts with the oldest and works his way down to the youngest. And Samuel keeps saying, oh yeah, I'm sure this is the one. This this looks like the guy. This looks like the king uh, that God would choose. And God says again and again, no, this isn't the one. And son after son comes. And uh, at the end, Samuel says to Jesse, no, isn't there anybody else? And Jesse says, oh, oh yes, hang on a minute, there is another one. Almost as if he's forgotten about him. Uh, there's a, just a slip of a lad, he's out looking after some sheep. Samuel says, I'm not going anywhere until I've seen him. And uh, so Jesse sends for Samuel, uh, for David, and David comes in, and God says, this is the one. And so right at the very beginning, we're being shown, aren't we, uh, that uh, David, there's nothing outwardly about him that says power. He is everything that Goliath isn't, isn't he? And uh, as we go into chapter 17, we see, don't we, how uh, we go back and forth, don't we? So the first 11 verses are all about the strength of Goliath and the fear he brings to the children of Israel. When we get to verse 12, we're back in Bethlehem, aren't we? We're back in this little country scene with this uh, old man and his eight sons, and three of them have joined up. They're in the army there at the Mount, uh, the Valley of Elah. But Daniel, uh, David, where is he? Well, he's just feeding his sheep. Uh, he's just doing, he's going to be the errand boy, isn't he? Jesse says, I've got some cheeses here uh, and I've got some grain here. Take it down to the battle. Uh, take some supplies down to the commander and see how the boys are getting on. See how your brothers are getting on. That's all David can do. David's just the messenger boy. He's just the weak uh, boy. He's just uh, uh, the lad at the end of the litter, as it were, who's uh, got no strength, nothing. He can't be in the army. He's not old enough. He's not strong enough. And when we get down to verse 28, we see how his older brother treats him. He says, oh, I know what you're here for. You're just here for a nose. You're just here because you're inquisitive. You want to see a bit of action. Uh, who, who's looking after those, uh, those sheep you're supposed to be looking after? That's all you're good for, David. Uh, even Eliab doesn't think much of David. See in verse 28. I know your pride and the insolence of your hearts. 
you've just come down to see the battle. And you see, there's nothing in him, is there? Indeed, as if we go on in the chapter tonight, we'll see how Saul looks at him and says, you can't fight Goliath. Uh, you can't fight this Philistine. And then, of course, when he appears before Goliath, Goliath almost laughs himself. Silly, doesn't he? Uh, look at me. Look at you. Uh, there's nothing in you, David. Uh, you can't win the battle. God's deliverer seems so weak, and yet he wins. And you see, that's the great story all through Scripture again, isn't it? So how does God rescue the children of Israel from the might of Pharaoh? He sends Moses. Moses is an 80-year-old man. Moses is a man who can't speak uh, publicly, and so God has to send Aaron along with him because he's uh, so weak in his voice, Moses. Or oh, think about uh, that deliverance in Jericho. How does God do it? He does it through the weakest of implements, doesn't he? Ordinary people walking around a city, blowing trumpets, shouting to the lords. And that's how they win the battle. Or think about the judges that God raises up in the book of Judges. And every one of them is a flawed character, isn't it? Think about Ehud with his withered right arm. Think about Gideon with his lack of faith. Think about Samson with all his moral issues. Every one of them is a flawed character. And yet, God chooses to deliver through something that outwardly is weak. And then, of course, ultimately, where do we see it more than anywhere else? It's at the cross, isn't it? Where Christ dies. It's the foolishness of the cross by which people are saved. It's the foolishness of the preaching of the cross by which people are saved. You and I are given eternal life because a man dies in our place. Uh, that's foolishness. That's a stumbling block. But it's God's way. And that's how it always is. God delivers through the weak. Uh, God chooses the weak things of this world to confound the mighty and the foolish things of this world to confound the strong and the wise. And isn't that the best way? Because then God gets all the glory and all the praise because he alone is worthy. And so you see, this story is of great relevance to us, living in our day and in our generation. You might feel yourself so weak. You might be the only Christian in your family. You might be the only Christian in your streets. You might be the only Christian in your workplace. The only Christian in your village. And you say, what can God achieve through me? And the story of David and Goliath is that God chooses the weak things. And God chooses the foolish things. And uh, uh, even though we might seem so weak and so ineffective, it is God and his people who get the victory. And so you and I can take courage from a passage like this. Uh, uh, though the enemy seems so powerful, he loses. Uh, though the deliverer seems so weak, he wins. How does he win? What's the secret of David's success? Well, we might answer some of those questions this evening. But it's good as we close this morning to look at what he says uh, there in verse 26. And it's interesting that this is the very first words we hear from David's mouth in the whole of the scriptures. Oh, he's appeared in chapter 16, but he doesn't say anything that's recorded there. The first words we actually hear from his lips are there in verse 26. And there are going to be some great words that flow from David's lips in the scripture, aren't there? Where would we be without the Lord is my shepherd? I shall not want. Where would we be with, uh, without, unto the hills I lift up my eyes, from whence comes my help? Where would we be without God is our refuge and our strength, very present help? They came from David's lips. How we thank God for the words that came from David's lips. This is the first thing that comes from his lips. That's interesting, isn't it? We often, we often are interested in people's last words, aren't we? What was the last thing they said? What were their last words? Well, David's first words are very interesting here in verse 26, because David sees the situation as it is, doesn't he? He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living gods? You see, this is a, a theological battle in a sense. This isn't just a battle between Israel and the Philistines. David sees it as something greater than that, doesn't he? Uh, he'll say, as we'll see this evening in verse 28, isn't there, verse 29, isn't there a cause? Uh, 
You see, he sees what others haven't seen. This is a battle between an uncircumcised Philistine and the armies of the living gods. You see, David serves a living God. The Israelites have forgotten that their God is a living God. Although they've had plenty of evidence through their history that their God is a living God who can deliver them, they've forgotten it. But David hasn't forgotten that his God is a living God. And it's faith in this living God uh, that's going to propel him into the battle and give him cause for optimism and eventually give him victory. That's what Hebrews 11 says, isn't it? It's by faith that David defeated Goliath. It's because he had faith in God. Because he had faith in a living God. And you see, it's not just that this God is a living God, but this God is a covenant-keeping God. You notice how he describes this Philistine, uh, Goliath. He describes him as an uncircumcised Philistine. Now, that's a medical fact, but it's not just a medical fact. This is a theological fact. Uh, This man is not a man of the covenant. Circumcision was the sign of the covenant. These Israelites were circumcised people. They were people who had the sign of the covenant upon them. And God is the covenant-keeping God. And the man who has defied them is outside of the covenant. God owes him nothing. And you see, that's how it is. You and I have a living God. And we are his covenant people. And as David sees this battle, he doesn't just see two armies ranged against each other. He doesn't see one champion against lots of people running away. He sees that this man who's outside of the covenant has challenged the living God. And you see, his faith is in a living, covenant-keeping God. And my friends, that's how we stand in our day and generation. We stand because we have a living God. You know, my friends, the gods of the nations around are dead gods. They never lived in the first place. Time and time again, uh, uh, the, uh, the armies of dead gods set themselves against the church. Just uh, eight, ten days ago, I was out in Killian. Been to Killian. Uh, Killian's very close to us. We often go out there for an afternoon. And uh, there was... uh, 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 there's a, a little row of shops there uh, and we were walking around the shops and uh, one of the shops at the end is quite a pagan shop there are all sorts of stuff in there and as you go closer to it you sense there's something evil there and uh, uh, the woman from the shop there was explaining to somebody uh, something to do with paganism and uh, there was a tree outside and she was saying oh this part of the tree uh, is for people who are positive and uh, people who are negative and this part of the tree is for people who, for whom there's no hope of salvation. And uh, I have to confess, my blood almost boiled within me. And I said to her, my friend, do you really believe that there are people who have no hope for salvation? We got into a conversation uh, about what salvation is and where salvation can be found. And, and that's right on our doorsteps. And the forces of paganism are all around us. But of course, Kalian's famous for another world power that set itself against the Church of Jesus Christ. The Roman Empire did the same thing, didn't it? And uh, busloads of people go to Kalia now every week through the summer because the remains of that empire are still there, aren't they? They keep digging up bits of it. Where's the Roman Empire? This empire that set itself against the church. This empire that burnt so many Christians in Bible times. Where is it now? It's in the dust of history, isn't it? Because you see, God's kingdom is glorious and God's kingdom is victorious. And the enemies come and go. Uh, These uh, gods that are dead gods, gods that never lived in the first place, they set themselves against Christ and against his church. But my friends, we have a living God. And he's a covenant-keeping God. And you and I, as the covenant people of the living gods, are assured of the victory. And so as we face Goliath, whether it's individual or as families or as a society, as a church, we do so knowing that we have a living God and he'll keep his covenant with his people and we're on a glorious victory side. May God bless those truths uh, to our heart as we worship him together.